If you'd like to open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This being the fourth Sunday of the month is the time that we have devoted to our theme of the year. And our theme of the year is hand in hand with the healer. And this morning we're going to talk about hand in hand with the healer facing disappointment. Begin reading with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Distress, discouragement, disappointment are pervasive. They're no respecter of persons. We often sing in a little children's class, Jesus loves them one by one, red, yellow, black, and white. And it doesn't matter what our race, doesn't matter our socioeconomic status, what our financial status. Distress, discouragement, disappointment come to us all. Paul expresses that here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It also is a perplexing question because of the responses that come as a result of discouragement the response may be well I thought that disappointment discouragement those are things that should come to people who who don't love God who don't obey God and it's as when we say that they almost deserve that because they don't love or obey God and they ought to get that while the people that love God and who who try to respect God they, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't have those things. They should be exempt from those things. And then it's also provocative because further response is not just who ought to be afflicted by that, but our internal response because sometimes those things drive people away from the Lord while other times people draw closer to the Lord. And this is one of the pivotal questions that those who challenge the question, is there a God, belief in God, will use. And so we need to have some confidence when we think about facing disappointments in life. And there are a few things I'd like to consider with you this morning about that. First thing I'd like for you to think about with me in this is, why should I, what should I consider What should I consider before I decide God has let me down? First of all, I I think I need to examine my own expectations. If my expectations have been that, that I should be exempt from any kind of suffering, then my expectations are not realistic. God never, God never decreed, God never wrote, God never revealed, God never said that because we become one of his children, that we would be exempt from suffering, from distress, and from disappointment. In fact, we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where here the apostle of all apostles, Paul, is enduring a thorn in the flesh, some kind of suffering that is taking place. And so we shouldn't have the expectation that, well, we're trying to be righteous, and because we're trying to be righteous, we should not undergo those things. It doesn't make it any easier to admit that we do. But that's not realistic. It's not even realistic from the biblical point of view. I mean, you think about the notable people in the Bible who endured disappointment. You think about Daniel and the challenges he faced. Think about Elijah and the challenges that he faced. And you think about the Lord himself 
and the challenges he faced. That pensive moment when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, how I would have gathered you to myself as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Sad words. Disappointing words to the Lord himself. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul will write to these good brethren, listen to how he says this in 1 Thessalonians 3 beginning in verse 1. Therefore, when we could no longer endure, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow labor in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. Notice he says, we sent Timothy to encourage you that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. Paul was concerned that they would be shaken by those things. And so first of all, before we decide that God's let us down, we need to think about our own expectations. Second of all, when you think about the consequences of free will, free will plays a part in this. We just celebrated a few days ago the tragedy, the catastrophe of September 11th, of 9-11. You think about the free will of those individuals who were flying those planes into the trade centers or into the Pentagon. Now, the ones that flew into the ground, they had some people who were trying to conquer them. That's a little bit different. Their free will was imposed upon by others who had a free will. But you think about all those people on those planes, the tragedy. They suffered at the hands of the free will of somebody else. And so... If God is going to overcome the free will of all evil men, then where does that stop? If we say, well, God should overcome the evil of this person or this situation that is afflicting me, then where does that stop? And where does God start imposing on the free will of all evil men? The fact of the matter is, we are free will creatures. And sometimes we are subject to the choices, the free will choices of others, and we suffer at the hand of the free will choices of others. It would be Shangri-La, utopian indeed, if God could pick and choose his righteous people to spare from those suffering the free will choices of evil men. But again, whose choice is he going to stop? God will not impose himself on the free will of men. And so we need to consider the free will of men, the choices of free will that man has. And then third, we need to also consider my own contribution to the trouble. I find it rather humorous, the scene with Ahab and Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, you have Ahab saying of Elijah, here comes the troubler, of Israel. But the real trouble of Israel was the guy accusing the other fellow of being the troubler of Israel. Here you have Ahab making the accusation, the troubler of Israel, but the reason Ahab is in the shape Ahab is in is not because of Elijah. It's because of his own contributions that he has made to the idolatry and the ruination of the nation itself and yet he totally ignores his own contributions to what is taking place if we suffer ill health because we spent years of our life abusing drugs or abusing alcohol then we shouldn't be surprised that we have ill health and we shouldn't blame God. 
give up on losing our jobs because we have been frivolous, because we have been spendthrifts with our money, we wind up with no money at all, we shouldn't blame God. We're always looking for someone to blame. And inevitably, just like with Adam and Eve, it comes back to God receiving the blame and the accusation. Just because my Monday prayers aren't answered by Friday, or the next week, or the next month, or the next year, doesn't mean God's not listening. I need to consider my own contribution to my own troubles. What have I done that has contributed to my own disappointment, my own distress, and my own discouragement? I think there are three things we need to think about before we begin to make accusation against God, before we can conclude that, well, God's let me down. Well, have I set some unrealistic expectations that God has not set? Have I considered the free will, my own free will in the matter, or the free will of others in the matter? Or have I considered my own contribution to what has produced the disappointment that I am incurring? I think there are three things that help us keep these things in perspective. The first of those three things that help us keep things in perspective <laughs> is when you think about God's timetable. Remember the song we sing, In His Time? That song, In His Time, really works well until you take the lyrics off the page and begin to put it in practical life. And then we want our time to be God's time. When we sing, In His Time, what we really mean is, In our time, Lord, and you need to do it in our time, not your time. But so when you take that off the page and begin to walk that in life, it really adds something. In Psalm chapter 27, in Psalm chapter 27, look at verses 13 through 14. Psalm 27, verses 13 through 14. The psalmist will say, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. What's the psalmist saying? He's saying, wait on the Lord in his time. In his time, not according to our expectations, but in his time. In Proverbs chapter 20, in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 4, we have an expression of something that happens when we want things in our time. In verse 4 of Proverbs chapter 20, the wise man will say, The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. And look at chapter 28. Chapter 28 and verse 19. Proverbs 28 and verse 19. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread. But he who follows frivolity will have poverty enough. When we try to impose our time on God's timetable, then's when we have the problem of reaping where we have not sown. Now think about God's time. Think about that young man, Joseph. How was Joseph when he went into slavery? Do you remember? 17. According to Genesis 39. How old was he when he becomes prime minister? 40. Do the math. How long did Joseph have to wait? How many years did Joseph have to wait on God's time? 13 years? Let's make that a little longer. How old was Abraham when God told him 
that Sarah would have his child? 75? How old was he when Isaac was born? Almost 100? 25 years? Do you think along the way, Moses, I mean, uh, Abraham might have thought, you know, God must have forgotten the promise that he gave me. Because it's been over 25 years that he gave that to me. But it was in God's time. Do you remember the promise that God made to Abraham? The prophecy God made to Abraham in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 14? In which he first tells Abraham something Abraham is not going to know. Abraham is not going to experience, but his progeny will. He said, your people are going to go into bondage 430 years. But when they come forth, they will be a strong and a mighty people. 430 years cumulatively in Egyptian bondage under the power of a Pharaoh who abused them, not a Pharaoh who loved them like Joseph's Pharaoh. And then finally, God with his mighty hand in his time delivered them. I love the statement in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. When in the fullness of time, God brought forth from woman the seed of woman. He brought forth the son. In his time. And so, we take advantage of the opportunity that we have in our time to plow the field to have the harvest. Not like the lazy man who, when the harvest time come, has nothing because in the winter he did not plow. We take advantage of the time God gives us now. But we do it in his time. The second thing I think that helps us understand something about that is we need to understand God's agenda. We need to understand God's agenda. Of all the, chap- the 42 chapters of the book of Job, at least from the book of Ricky, I think the, the two most important chapters in the whole book of Job are the first two chapters. They're not the subsequent chapters when you have the conversation with Job, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and then you have the conversation at the end with that young man It's not chapter 42 when Job speaks and says, I have spoken like a foolish man. I think the first two chapters are the two most important chapters of the book of Job because they set the contest. They set what it's really about. Here here God has assembled with the sons of God. And here comes Satan to the presence. And he's making accusations. And God speaks with regard to Job and said, Have you considered my Job, my servant Job, more righteous than all in the land? And Satan's accusation is, yeah, he's that way because you give him all the toys. You give him all, all the, all the uh, things that have life under the sun and value to it. All the adult toys, that you give him everything he needs. If you take that away from him, he's going to curse you. And then Satan says, does Job fear God for naught? Notice, Satan doesn't get in God's face and point his finger and say, Job fears you only because you give it to him. He simply asks a question, does Job fear God for naught? The implication is, yes. And so God enters the contest with Satan for Job and says, you can't touch him, but he takes everything Job has and Job cursed him not. Finally, Satan comes back and says, well, you didn't let me touch him. You let me touch him and he'll curse you. Okay, you can touch him, but you can't take his life. And he does, but Job and all things did not curse him. Is God just letting Job have a hard time here? Does God just want, is, he just, is Job just a pawn on the chessboard, just moving him about, let Satan have his way with him? What's God's agenda here? Job is proving what God had said about Job, or God is, uh, Job is proving what God had said about Job, and that it, he is more righteous, and that he did not sin. And so we bring it to us. Why? Why are we allowed to endure disappointment, discouragement, and distress? Why are we allowed to endure those things that challenge us like that? 
Well, I think Paul answered the question for us in Ephesians 1 verse 18. In the first of the two prayers in the book of Ephesians, he says, I pray that your understanding may, may be enlightened, that the eyes of your, darkness of your eyes may be opened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, number one, what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints, number two, what is the greatness of his power, but go back to number two. That you might know, God, that you might know what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints. God's agenda is that he will have people in view of everything they face, good or bad, that will say, I love you, I bow before you, you are my Lord, you are my God. You see, the playing field has to be level. And what Satan was saying about Job is the playing field's not level because you won't let me at him. And God says to, to Satan, yes, I'll level the playing field, but you can't take his life. And in all things, Job did not sin. And the question for me and for you is this. Here's God's agenda. I want the riches of my inheritance. That's not our inheritance. I want the riches of my inheritance in the saints. I want the riches of my inheritance in people who in view of all the good things I give them, all the bad things they suffer, that they will choose me. Those are my inheritance. You see, God had that agenda too. Isn't it interesting, in Genesis 39, you have this repeated phrase regarding Joseph. And God was with him, God was with him, God was with him. In chapter 39, does Joseph know that? It doesn't seem to me he does. Does Joseph ever figure it out? Yes, because by the time you come to chapter 50, Jacob has died. The brothers have come before him, and now they think, okay, revenge is in the hand of Joseph. Joseph here and now he's going to exterminate us or throw us into a pit for a while but instead Joseph says this you meant it for evil but God meant it for good that he might save many people wait a minute and Genesis 15 13 through 14 what did God tell Abraham that your people are going to endure 430 years of bondage. Abraham doesn't know where that's going to be. But at the end of that, they'll come out a great and mighty people. And how do they leave Egypt? A great and mighty and powerful people. It took 430 years for God to accomplish his agenda there. And Jacob, um, Joseph figured out when he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We often quote Romans 8, 28 and say all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and look forward to his appearing. And that's true. That's not what Romans 8, verse 28 means though. Romans 8, verse 28 refers to those who are called, those who are justified, those who are glorified. And for those people, he's provided everything they need for salvation. That's what he's talking about there. But Joseph says it well. You meant it for evil. What can God do with evil in his time? In his time, God can make good come out of it. Now, if I'm the one who is suffering, if I'm the one going through the prison, if I'm the one being accused like Joseph, if I'm the one being smitten like Job, Here's where the rub is. Am I going to be able to have the perspective that this evil that is happening to me can produce some good? And because we are prone to think no further than the point of our nose, our answer is often no. Because we want the relief 
of the disappointment today. But sometimes it doesn't come in that day. And so we need to consider God's agenda. Then we need to also consider the bigger picture here. There is a bigger picture. So if I have suffered loss of job or financial reverses, and that is imposing upon me a serious challenge and a strong disappointment. How can I balance that? Well, in Ephesians ch chapter 1 and verse 3, he talks about, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. When we measure the loss of one thing against the spiritual blessings that God has given us to be forgiven, to be redeemed, to have the mystery of the gospel revealed, to have the earnest of the spirit that has been given to us. When we have all those things that measure against that, how do those things weigh? But again, here's the challenge. Have you ever seen when someone is baptized, their sins washed away? When we lived in Del Rio, Cody was about nine years old, and we had a baptism. Well, the baptistry there wasn't like the nice fiberglass baptistry we have here. They're like the baptistries that used to plague brethren all the time. It was kind of a steel metal baptistry that leaked well it hadn't been cleaned in a while and so the water had scum on it and after the baptism was over Cody said dad are those the sins that were washed away have you ever seen sins washed away I've never seen sins washed away have you ever seen the blood cleanse. I've never seen the blood cleanse. But tangibly, have you ever experienced financial reversal? Ha tangibly, have you ever experienced ill health? Yes. Do you see the difficulty there? Do you see the difficulty of perspective? In one, I feel it. It's imposing something on me. And the other, I have to have confidence in these spiritual blessings that they're real and they're powerful and they're greater than what is imposed upon me. But let's take it a level even more. What if, what if it's more than just something financial or ill health? What if it's something even more poignant, more personal, but loss somehow? What's the perspective? Is the perspective not balanced by the fact that it's enough that God's Son gave His life for us? But were we there when they crucified our Lord? Did we really see that? Oh, we read about it. We've seen pictures about it, but we haven't, we haven't touched it. We haven't tasted it. We haven't smelled it. But when we suffer loss of something or someone, we feel that pensively. But will we be able to see a bigger picture? That the suffering for this moment is nothing to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. When we read that from Romans 8, verse 18, is it one thing to read it, or do we really, really put our confidence there and really, really believe that? Our challenge is when it has to become real to us. You see, disappointment hand in hand with a healer and dealing with disappointment is a real thing. But those things that disappoint us, whatever the level is, Paul will say are nothing to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. In fact, he will say further, day by day we're getting older. The older man, the older man is getting older every day. 
But inwardly, what's happening? We're being renewed every day. So outwardly we're perishing, but inwardly we're being renewed every day. So the inward man is increasing while the older of a man, outward man, is decreasing. But can we really put our confidence in that? Do we really see the inner man continuing to grow? The inner man continue to be renewed? When the outer man weighs so heavily on us? It's hard to see the inner man being renewed when we are the ones who have suffered the loss. When we're the ones that are grieving, it's hard to see that inner man being renewed when we are feeling the weight of the world bearing down upon us. And we feel the fatigue of the physical just overwhelming us and we just are so weary and worn out by it to then really believe, okay, the inner man is being renewed while the older man is perishing and melting away. I wonder, did Job really feel like... (laughs) The inner man was being renewed when he had to take a broken piece of pottery to scrape the sore boils that were plaguing his body. And when Joseph is beat down after beat down after beat down, does he really think that inwardly he's being renewed? Do you see our challenge with that? It's one thing to preach about it. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing when disappointment, when something that threatens our life happens, that we can say it's enough. It's enough that God so loved me, he gave his only begotten son. And until we have experienced that and can come to that, we haven't understood the power of what it means. Our suffering here is but for a moment and nothing to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. But I prayed to God, and I prayed to God about it. And sometimes the answer is not as immediate as we'd like, and sometimes it's not as discernible as we like, and sometimes as we say it's wait, and sometimes the answer is no. Not that I think he's the most righteous man at all, but Garth Brooks saying, I thank God for unanswered prayer, and I've got to tell you this in prayers I've prayed along the way, I thank God he said no to, because I was so foolish to pray them sometimes He says no to things. And sometimes we pray that prayer, but it takes 430 years. It takes 13 years. It takes 25 years for those prayers to be answered. Sometimes it's not that immediate. Sometimes praying and unanswered prayers is a complicated thing. But like Paul, we pray, Lord, please open the eyes of their understanding. So that in our disappointment, we understand this. We are walking hand in hand with the healer. And while we may not see his literal footprints, he is the one that is carrying us every step of the way. And as Moses will say, we are safe in his arms. We have to wait on the Lord. And sometimes our time is not His time. Because our expectations, our expectations that God has not given. And sometimes our will or the free will of others has imposed themselves on me. Or sometimes I discount what I have contributed in this. But I need to remember God acts in his time. I need to remember the bigger picture. And I need to remember he got an agenda. Why did Christ come? He had an agenda. And the agenda was this. I'm not coming to save this earth. 
I didn't die for this earth. I'm not trying to restore this earth to the Garden of Eden. This earth is inanimate. This earth is going to melt away. This earth is not going to last. What I came to do was to save not an earth that is scarred. I came to save man that is lost. So that lost man can have fellowship with me again. Because his sins can be forgiven. But the power of the blood of my son offered on the cross, but not just that, the power that same blood that forgave has the same power to help me break the habit of the deepest, most addictive sin I can be involved in. When his will becomes my will. Not when my will becomes his will. His agenda is for our salvation and for our transformation. Do you need a Savior this morning? Do you need a Savior that died for you? Do you need a Savior that can cleanse you? Then why don't you come and be baptized, have your sins washed away while we stand and while we sing. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can. But thank you for connecting with us.